Okay, this sermon is entitled, Seven Inevitabilities of a False Gospel. I'd like to open up with prayer, and then with a few verses. Dear God, thank you for giving us your clear word. Thank you for allowing us to see what it says. Bless the listeners. I ask all this in Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 77 reads, I cried unto God with my voice, even unto God with my voice, and he gave ear unto me. In the day of my trouble I sought the Lord. My sore ran in the night and ceased not. My soul refused to be comforted. I remembered God and was troubled. I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed. Selah. Now, the word inevitability, according to the dictionary, is the quality of being certain to happen. And any time a person is preaching a false gospel, and people are gullible enough to fall for it and believe it, there are certain inevitabilities that will transpire as a result of the false gospel. Number one, the first inevitability is that a person cannot trust Christ alone and then trust a false gospel at the same time. It's like taking a bus and a taxi to work at the same time. It doesn't make any sense. When it comes to biblical trust, it's either on Christ or on something else. Jesus said in John chapter 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he didn't say I'm one of the ways, meaning that you can trust in some other avenue to get to heaven. According to the Bible, salvation is exclusively by Jesus Christ alone, and you must trust him alone to be saved. But if you have a false gospel, you will inevitably and ineluctably trust in that false gospel instead. Number two, the second inevitability of a false gospel is it lowers God's standard. Now turn over to Matthew chapter 5. It reads in verse 48, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Now Jesus was speaking in hyperbole here. He was not telling people that they had to be perfect in order to go to heaven based on their own effort. He was just making a point that God was 100% perfect, impeccable, and that if you want to attain salvation, you have to be perfect as well. And because nobody is perfect, that's why they need a Savior. That's why they need salvation by grace. So this verse is simply spoken hyperbolically and hypothetically, and when it comes to these false gospels and the false prophets who teach them, they are simply lowering God's standard. They're telling you that you have to repent of your sins, give up Doritos, throw away your cigarettes or whatever. They're simply lowering God's standard. They're also asseverating that God will accept a person based on this type of lawful acquiescence, when in reality, that's not the case at all. The standard is perfection, and nobody can attain perfection on their own. The third inevitability of a false gospel is that it leads to boasting. Now, I've heard people deny this, and they claim that, well, you have to have works to be saved, but it's God who gets all the credit. But that's not what the Bible teaches in Romans chapter 3. Let's take a look at verses 26 and 27. Now, in verse 26, the Bible teaches that salvation and justification are by faith alone. It reads, To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Now, after establishing this fact, the Bible goes on to say in verse 27, Where is boasting then? It is excluded by what law? Of works, nay, but by the law of faith. So, whether a person is going to boast or not is immaterial because they would have boasting rights if salvation were by the law. But because salvation is 100% by grace, through faith alone in Christ alone, and because God is just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus, there's no boasting allowed. Number four, the fourth inevitability. Hear that, Mr. Anderson? That is the sound of inevitability. The fourth inevitability of a false gospel is that it leads to a man-made benchmark or a man-made metric or a barometer. Now, obviously, a barometer measures atmospheric pressure, but there's also a more broad usage of the word that just simply means a gauge or an indicator. And this always ensues from a false gospel because nobody knows how they have to live, yet they're teaching that you have to live a certain way. So the standard becomes up to man. For instance, you have some stupid loser out there telling you to repent of certain sins, but he's not going to tell you to repent of the sins that he's culpable of. And it's going to change from person to person, from pastor to pastor, from false prophet to false prophet. And like I've already pointed out, God's standard is perfection. So man has no right to create 
or establish some changeable criterion and this leads to nothing but confusion and uncertainty. Number five, the fifth inevitability of a false gospel is that it leads to subjective false assurance. Now, the reason why I say false assurance is because anytime you're looking to self, you can't have assurance. Even if you're dumb enough to believe that you're good enough to get into the kingdom of heaven on your own, what makes you think that's not going to change a week from now? And how do you even know if God will accept what you consider good? There is no way to know. Now, when it comes to true assurance, you have to take God at his word. Jesus said in John 6, 47, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. If you believe on Jesus Christ for salvation, you have his word that you have everlasting life. That's all the assurance you need. But a false gospel can only inevitably produce false, man-made, subjective, delusional assurance. Number six, the sixth inevitability of a false gospel, is you have egg all over your face. Just imagine being on the streets with your stupid picket signs, yelling at everybody, telling them to repent of your sins, when these stupid Royce preachers out there who are not even saved haven't even repented of their sins. It just makes them look like a bunch of idiots. These people should just put on a dunce cap and a kick me sign on their back and start picking their nose. Because teaching a false gospel makes you look that stupid. Finally, number seven, the seventh inevitability of a false gospel is a false conversion. People do not get saved by an accursed gospel. And that's where false prophets come from. When somebody believes that you have to repent of your sins, or that you have to have the works, or that you can lose your salvation, or that you have to persevere to the end, or that you have to bear fruit, or this changed life garbage, then they don't get saved. Because the only way anyone is saved is by grace through faith. As a result of not getting saved, they go out and they preach this foolishness. And that's how you can identify a false convert. It's by their message. So the conclusion of the matter is this. A false gospel, no matter what it is, leads to nothing but all this foolishness and to no salvation. Whereas if you believe the true gospel, that Jesus Christ died for your sins, he was buried and rose again, eternal life is a free gift, it's by grace through faith alone plus nothing, and that the believer is eternally secure, this will lead to the antithesis of all seven inevitabilities. For instance, number one, the true gospel allows people to trust Christ alone. Number two, it doesn't lower God's standard. It keeps it where it is and just shows us that we need a Savior. Number three, the only thing we can boast in is Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. It doesn't lead to self-boasting. Number four, we don't have a man-made standard. We have God's perfect standard. Number five, we have true assurance. Number six, we don't have egg all over our faces. And number seven, the true gospel leads to a true conversion. So that's all I have. Let me go ahead and close in prayer. Dear God, thank you for giving us your clear word. Thank you for allowing us to see what it says. Bless the listeners. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.